Hello, Solar Eclipse Timer users. This is Dr. Telepin checking back in with you. I enjoyed everything about the 2017 eclipse that crossed the United States. A surprise thrill happened because of timing it in universal time. Let me tell you a story about an amazing realization I had on Eclipse Day. Second contact in two minutes. The 2017 eclipse was fascinating because it went from coast to coast across the United States and the path was very close to being centered with the point of greatest eclipse being in western Kentucky. If you drill down and look closely at some of the details of this eclipse, there are some really amazing things. It is due to the confluence of umbral speed, width of the country, time zones, contact times, and understanding universal time. Okay, let's start with the path. Before the eclipse, when I was giving lectures about the eclipse, I would show a slide with these general facts about the path. For this episode, what I want to focus on is the average speed across the country's land mass, which was about 1,700 miles per hour, and the fact that at that speed, it would cross from coast to coast in one hour and 30 minutes. Remember that time. It will be important later. Now, let's talk about the U.S. time zones. This eclipse crossed all four time zones in the U.S. It started on the West Coast and Pacific time, then Mountain time, then Central time, and Eastern time. So all across the country, people had to time the eclipse in the local time of their observing position. Everyone had to deal with the online eclipse contact time calculators that presented the contact times in universal time. Then they had to subtract their time zone offset from universal time to get the correct local time. This was done so their personal clock time matched the time that the eclipse was actually going to happen at their observing location. Almost all cell phones are set up to adjust the local time zone. So my solar eclipse timer app did the time zone conversion automatically. The initial contact times are calculated in universal time, but when the times are loaded, they're converted to the correct time zone. Here's how the time zones affected timing second contact. In central Oregon, C2 was about 10.20 a.m. local time. In central Wyoming, C2 was about 11.41 a.m. local time. In central Missouri, C2 was about 1.18 p.m. local time. In central South Carolina, C2 was about 2.42 p.m. local time. The clock times that people used for the eclipse spanned four clock hours, 10 a.m. on the West Coast to 2 p.m. on the East Coast. But we already discussed that the eclipse crossed the entire U.S. in one and a half hours. So the important point I'm trying to make is the combination of the eclipse moving from West to East, adjusting the time zones, and focusing on your local time negates appreciating the smooth, steady progress of the traveling umbra. Let's talk about time zones some more. Luckily, for purposes of testing my app, I live close to a really special location in Tennessee. There was a spot in Tennessee where the path of the eclipse crossed the time zone change. Very cool. Just east of a town called Dunlap, Tennessee, there is an area where the southern edge of the eclipse path crossed the time zones between Central Time and Eastern Time. I would drive back and forth along Route 111 and see how Apple and Android phones pinged the cell phone towers to update their time zone settings, and then I would confirm that my Solar Eclipse Timer app would adjust correctly. Because of this testing, something occurred to me about the small town of Dunlap, which is located in Central Time. The nearest large city is Chattanooga, Tennessee which is about 24 miles to the southeast. The people in Dunlap get their TV programming out of Chattanooga, and Chattanooga is in Eastern Time. So when they hear any announcements about scheduled events, the people in Dunlap are always hearing the times in Eastern Time. 
So one Monday morning, after a weekend trip to Dunlap for app testing, I called the Dunlap Municipal Building and spoke to a nice lady who answered the phone. I asked her the relevant questions. Question. Ma'am, where do you get your news from? Answer. The TV stations in Chattanooga. Question. Does it create any issues since they always announce things in Eastern time? Answer. We are used to it. We always have to adjust. So, if a Chattanooga TV station announces that C2 for Sale Creek is 2.31.59 p.m., the people in Dunlap better adjust or they will miss it. Their local time for C2 is 1.31.59 p.m. The clocks are different by an hour, but the actual movement of the Umbra is going to reach Dunlap and Sale Creek within seconds of each other. This was a huge revelation for me because I realized there were probably a lot of small towns in the country where people have to do that. But I was interested in this eclipse because along the path there were three states that within the borders of the state the path had two time zones, Tennessee, Nebraska, Oregon. All of the observers in those areas had to be careful with their timing. But again, my point is the need to focus on the time zone so much ruins the big picture, appreciating the smooth, steady movement of the umbra across the country. So what is it about understanding universal time that is so important and sometimes helpful? It strips local time zones from the picture. Based off the prime meridian, or longitude zero, it is a time standard based on the Earth's rotation. Because it eliminates the local time zone issues, astronomers like to use it, and some may have used it to time the eclipse. So here's the story that will tie this all together. Something popped into my head about three days before the eclipse, because I was thinking about the Umbra traveling across the entire country. I took one of my extra Android phones that I used for testing. I stopped automatic time zone sensing, and forced it to be universal time by choosing a city in the list that had a zero time zone offset. So that meant that the clock time showing on the front of solar eclipse timer was showing universal time. I changed the time label on the app to display universal time. Then on the back of the phone I wrote down the second contact time in universal time for the Oregon coast and then the second contact times for the western border of all of the states in the path. This way I could look at this phone and know exactly when the umbra was hitting the border of a state. Since everything is in universal time, there is no time zone offset. The time you see is what is happening in real time. But even then, I did not realize the cool thing I had stumbled upon. It did not occur to me until the time of the eclipse. We were in Tennessee in Eastern time, and first contact for us was 1.04.06 p.m. local time. But on my phone using universal time, the clock was reading 17.04.06. Then I looked at my second contact times on the back, and I see that on the coast of Oregon, totality begins at 17.15.57. My C1 time was 11 minutes before the Oregon Coast C2 time. That is so cool. Why is that? Because the duration of the partial phases from C1 to C2 for this eclipse took about one and a half hours. And remember what I said at the start of this video. The Umbra was going to cross the entire country in about one and a half hours. So for me, in my position in eastern Tennessee, I was a little ahead of the one and a half hour time it was going to take for the umber to cross the country. So my C1 time just preceded the West Coast C2 time. I was so excited to realize this. So right after I took my first partial phase image of my sequence, I ran up to the place where they had the public address system. I announced to the crowd the countdown of the umbra hitting the coast of Oregon. Do you have any idea how exciting this was? Here we were in Tennessee, and the large crowd there, just a few minutes before, 
had just witnessed C1 happen. I remember my announcement. Hey everyone, the Umbra just hit the coast of Oregon. Game on, it's coming our way. As the eclipse progressed, I announced the Umbra hitting the western edge of every state right up to Kentucky. So as our partial phases were getting smaller and smaller, the Umbra was getting closer and closer state by state along the path. It was like the ominous feeling of an approaching storm. You can't stop it. You can't slow it. You can't alter its direction. It's going to come and it's going to be on time. But for an eclipse, what is approaching is something beautiful and special. It was incredibly exciting for me in the crowd. And the interesting thing for me was I stumbled upon this great timing nuance just because I thought it would be neat to set up a phone in universal time and because I happened to be in the perfect spot in the path of this eclipse for the timing to work out. So the reason I am explaining this in such excruciating detail is because I want you to be able to do it. It won't work well for 2019 and 2020 across South America because the land mass is so narrow there is not much time to announce many crossing points. It won't work well for the Antarctic eclipse in 2021. It won't work well for the hybrid eclipse in Southeast Asia in 2023 because most of it is over water. But look at the path in 2024 over the United States. Starting with the coast of Mexico, it will cross three time zones. But if you are timing in universal time, you don't care. The sweet spot for fun announcements will be Ohio and northwestern Pennsylvania, because here your C1 time will just precede the C2 time at the coast of Mexico. Here's an approximate time for C1 at Cleveland, Ohio, 1759.29. Here's an approximate time for C2 at the coast of Mexico, 1806.58. In Cleveland at C1, you will be about six minutes ahead of C2 at the coast. So you would have time to announce the Umbra hitting the coast of Mexico, then the border to Texas, Arkansas, Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana. I am telling you, the crowd will love it. Thank you for watching this Solar Eclipse Timer episode. I hope you don't think I am too crazy for worrying about details like this. But this incidental finding of mine is a great teaching moment that I want to share with you because eclipses can be a once in a lifetime event and I want you to understand and enjoy as many aspects of an eclipse as possible. Please consider subscribing by clicking on the subscribe button below and then click the little bell. Then you will be notified when I post new videos. Share the video with friends. Also post comments and questions. If you don't feel like subscribing now, that's okay. But please monitor this channel for more Eclipse educational material. Thanks again. I appreciate your time.